Hey everybody, welcome back to the Axe Challenge. We're diving in today to chapter 17, and this gives us a little glimpse into some of the travels that Paul is taking. It also allows us to say some fun city names like Apollonia and Thessalonica and Berea. And today we find ourselves uh, looking ahead to ch uh, verse 16 where Paul is headed to Athens. Now there's a few things you should know about the city of Athens. First of all, Athens was the largest city, the oldest city in the world at this time. It is the oldest city that we know of. And it's in the country that we know today as Greece. Athens was a place where uh, people of all types of intellectual uh, levels would gather in, in Athens. They came, they taught, they learned, they kind of came into their own in the city of Athens. And when you think about names like Plato or Aristotle or Socrates, you will often think about Athens. So another thing to remember here as we look at Acts chapter 17 is that Paul was in a foreign land. He's not Greek. He is a Jewish leader who actually didn't know Jesus when Jesus was teaching, but he uh, knew many of the disciples. He's since formed a community with these followers of Jesus who were preaching and teaching about Jesus as much as they could. Now, there wasn't a Bible like we have today that Paul could simply show up in Greece and hand over to these people who he was telling about Jesus. So he had to rely on teaching, on sitting with people, on forming relationships. And uh, at this point, we, we come to this chapter, this verse in Acts, where we can kind of observe as Paul is having one of these conversations. So while, while Paul was waiting in Athens, he was deeply distressed that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with Jews and the devout persons and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened there. So we see that Paul is going to where the people are, not only in religious places like synagogues, as he points out, but in common places like marketplaces. And you'd expect from any of us who are receiving new information for the first time that we would receive this with some type of questioning. So we hear uh, the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debating with him. They said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling them about the good news of Jesus and the resurrection. So these philosophers, they take him and brought, bring Paul to the Areopagus and they ask him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're preaching? It sounds rather strange to us. So we would like to know what it means. So these philosophers, they take him to this Areopagus, which is also a fun word to say. And that's actually a, a real place in Athens, which is said to have been the place where the god Ares uh, was stood trial for having murdered Poseidon's son. So it's an actual place. It's a place where people went to debate philosophical and moral issues of the time. So the, they say, to, they, they ask Paul these questions. They're, they're curious. They want to know more information. And what Paul says to them, um, as, he, as he points out to these, to these uh, philosophers, he says, um, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are. So Paul, at this point, is pointing out to these philosophers, I see that you are religious. You've prayed to a different God for diff in different temples for different reasons. You've uh, also, as Paul points out, built an altar to an unknown God. This is something that they probably did to just cover all of their bases, an altar that that they built to an unknown God. And then Paul says to them, um, I am here to proclaim to you that a lore about a Lord who does not live in shrines or is made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives all mortals life and breath and all things. So not only can you see that this God, when you, you can see who this God is when you look around all of creation, Paul is telling them, but in fact, God also raised Jesus from the dead in order to show us how God reigns over all of the earth. And again, this is brand new information to these people, to these philosophers, to these Greeks who Paul is talking to. And in a lot of ways, it's in unbelievable for them to be hearing these things. When someone dies, they're dead, they would have thought. But a resurrection, that is something completely unheard of, something they're not sure about. But Paul even uh, quotes in this point a Greek 
poet in order to say, listen, I know your people enough to know how to talk to you. It's as if he's demonstrating that he's not totally detached from their reality. It's like he realized that in order to reach new people, he needed to be relatable. He needed to speak their language and not simply say, hey, I know something that you don't know. I'm right and you're wrong. Change your ways or else. That's not the way Paul approached this. So what can we take from this story as we think about being the church today? Well, first, I want to come back to the people uh, that Paul is telling his story to, those who had never heard it before. And even as Paul is telling this story of the resurrection, and uh, he says that God can do all of these things through Jesus so that people would search for God. In another translation of the Bible, you might read, so that they may reach out and look for God although God is never far away. There's a sense that this movement within some sort of seeking way is healthy and good. So first, a question for you to think about. Where are you reaching out and seeking for God, searching to know more? And second, a question relating to those who are maybe skeptics, who are doubtful about Christianity. Maybe people who've been hurt by the church and have stepped away but are open to learning more. How could the church honor their curiosity rather than point a judging finger at it? Thanks so much. We can't wait to see you tomorrow for Acts chapter 18.